want to welcome you this morning. It's good to see you. One announcement that was not made that we want to make mention of is that uh, the Shockley's daughter, Tyler, was baptized Wednesday night after the worship service. Uh, she made it known that she was ready to be baptized into Christ, and we're so proud for them and proud that she took that action. Tyler will be away for a few weeks. She's gone to visit relatives, and so she won't be here for us to get the to uh, congratulate and all that, but we are thankful and are happy for that baptism, and we know that she'll, she's going to serve the Lord and, and live her life for the cause of Jesus Christ, and this is what we want everybody to do, to make up their minds to do. That's why we're gathering together and preaching and teaching with that hope that we'll give our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see all of y'all this morning. As was said, probably a little short this morning, but we've still got a pretty good crowd. Good to have all of you here. There's a contrast made in the Bible that we worship and serve a God. There's probably people that ignore one or the other of these particulars about God. I think it's real important to know the God you serve. A lot of people have a romanticized notion about God, but the Bible speaks of a God that is both good and severe. And I think it deserves that we understand both those sides to the God that we serve. From the very beginning, I think you see the contrast. You open up your Bible and you read about the creation, and then you read about that there is two sides to what God has told us. He said to man back there at the beginning, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Two sharp contrasts of what their conduct had to be. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. When you read that, you see that contrast, and you see the fact that God has been good to them to provide for them in the garden, but God has rules. And if those rules are violated, there would be consequences. The positive is seen in that God was providing and giving them of every tree in that garden the opportunity for them to partake of. But the other side, the negative side, is seen in the fact that if they were to eat of it, in that day, their relationship with God will have been broken. They will die. They will ultimately die physically, but God's not saying in that very day that you'd eat it, that they would drop dead suddenly, but that in that day, things would change between them and God. Adam and Eve wouldn't sustain the relationship that they had had once more. So you get the hint of God's goodness and severity from the very second chapter of the Bible. In Romans chapter 11, verse 22, it actually uses the very terms I'm talking about here. And he says, Behold the goodness and the severity of God. Now look at it. Therefore consider the goodness and severity of God. On those who fell, and he refers back to the children of Israel, on those who fell, God exhibited severity. But towards you, God will exhibit goodness if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you will be cut off. In that, you have the fact plainly displayed that God is a good God and a merciful God, but God is also a severe God. He can deal with you severe in severity. <coughs> God's goodness. There's just no shortage of examples of that. Everywhere you look, all around us, all the time, there are examples of the goodness of God. It says in Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to all. There's not one person on the face of this, on the face of this planet that's not seen exhibitions of God's goodness. The vilest atheist, the vilest sinner, has been treated in a good way by Almighty God during this lifetime. He has received blessings from God. His mercies are over all of his works. And that's not talking about God's final mercy in the sense of judgment day. He's just simply saying that God has shown mercy. God has given us food. God has given us provisions. God has so ordained this life and this world that it works in such a way that we can have those physical blessings. God is a good God. 
We read in James chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good gift comes from his hand. And that God is not the kind of God that changes that. He has always has been good to us throughout the centuries. Man has been the recipient of his blessings. Every good and perfect gift comes from Almighty God. But you know what? God's goodness has led to him doing certain things. And it, it has provided for us. It's made, you know, f physical blessings for us. But one of the things, like in Psalm 33, verse 5, it says that God loves righteousness and judgment. And the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. I, I think you need to make that connection. God loves righteousness and judgment. And God has exhibited that all over the world. He's shown us that he expects righteousness and God will judge between good and evil in that sense. So we see by the teaching of the things of God that example. In Psalm 25 verse 8, it says, Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. I think part of the goodness and the grace of God is seen in the fact that Almighty God exhibits his goodness by showing us the right way to go. Not only does he send the sunshine and the rain and all these earthly physical blessings that mankind can have, but he also has showered us with his teaching. God will, loves us and God cares about us and God is good and God is upright. So he makes sure that there is an opportunity for man to hear the truth. He teaches sinners in the way. That's part of God's goodness. When Paul writes in Romans chapter 2, he tries to get across the thought that when God is good, when we see these examples of God's goodness, when you think about, and, and I know you probably pray about these things from time to time and thank God for his provisions. When you do that, these should speak to us. When we see the blessings of God, all that should speak to us, certain things. Paul says, do you despise the riches of his goodness? The fact that God has been forbearing towards us and long-suffering. Do you not realize that it's the goodness of God that should be leading us to repentance? In other words, here God is trying to show us that he is a good God, that he does love us, that he has tried to do for us. That he would have good things for our life and good blessings for us all. But he says that some people aren't taking that the right way. He said, do you not realize that it's that goodness of God that I'm, I, I'm inserting the word should lead you to repentance because it should, but it doesn't for a lot of people. I tell you, there's a lot of people who think the goodness of God all these blessings that God gives and the sunshine and the rain and everything else that God does for us and the crops and the, you know, the bounty, the prosperity that we in America have and all the rest. A lot of people look at that as if, well, I'm real thankful to God for all of that. I'm real glad he does that because I intend to go enjoy it rather than worshiping God. They don't think from the standpoint, you know, if he's so good to me, I want to do for him. I want to serve God. I want to live his way. But instead, they're thinking, I, I want to use these things in a selfish way. God's blessed me with prosperity, so let me run out and have everything I want, buy everything I want, instead of, you know, maybe giving of my means on the first day of the week and sharing with others. People have the wrong attitude. In other words, the goodness of God should lead us to repentance. The very fact, we, you know, people sit around and say, boy, I'm glad, it, you know, I, I don't know if the judgment day is really coming or not. I don't know if I believe that or not, but the Bible surely says it's coming. But they look at all of that, and then they turn around and say, well, God hadn't judged us, and maybe God won't judge us anytime soon. So I'm going to act like I want to act. I'm going to go on living because surely God's not going to do that anytime right away. And he said, don't you realize that God's being long-suffering? God's showing forbearance. Because what we understand is, you know, I've heard righteous people say it a lot. Well, with all the sin that's in the world today, why didn't God just come judge it? Why didn't God just act? Why, you know, all these terrible things that go on. 
Why didn't Jesus just come back and call them into it all and, and judge it all? Well, we're told two or three times, at least in the scripture, the reason he hasn't done it so far, it's called forbearance. That God could and that God ultimately will, but as he says in 2 Peter, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God's goodness, the riches of his forbearance, he's being long-suffering. But there are people that take all of that and say, well, that means my God is a permissive God because he's not doing anything about sin. He doesn't care whether people you know, live together or get married. He doesn't care if people cheat and lie and steal. He doesn't care you know, they commit vile sins and all of that. God just doesn't care about those things because you know, he's a loving God. He's not going to judge anybody. They're misreading all of this because he says all of these things should say to us that God is showing patience and forbearance but it shouldn't mean that God won't act. And that's where people are going wrong with their understanding. The goodness of God should be leading us to repentance. I want you to think about three words that we need to consider this day, and one of those words is that word severity. That word severity means, it literally, if you took the word, it means a cutting off. A cutting off. And it, it came to suggest the idea of being dealt with in a very rough and harsh fashion. That God will deal with those who rebel against him in severity. He will cut them off. He will deal with them in a rough and sharp way. Think about the word wrath. God is a God of wrath. The Bible tells us this over and over again. God is a God who will display what the scripture talks about as wrath. Now, wrath is an anger with a desire to respond in a punishing way. We're going to look at some scriptures in a minute that warn man about showing his wrath, but let's be real clear. Though man should not show his wrath, God is wrathful. God has wrath within him. We'll talk about the difference in a moment. <coughs> the third word is the word vengeance. And, and vengeance suggests the, idea, <coughs> suggests the idea of revenge, <coughs> avenging, <coughs> excuse me, revenge, avenging, and punishment. That, that there will be, you know, things enacted, just like wrath suggested that you're angry and desire to punish that person. Vengeance means I go out and do it. I act on that. So you have those three things right there. Now we're going to look at some verses. Notice here in Colossians chapter 3 verse 8 it says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these things like anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth. Well, wrath and anger and malice are some of those angry terms that suggest that we you know, have this desire. We des desire to harm someone because they have perhaps made us angry and made us furious. It, it, we're even warned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, be angry. In other words, it, it may come upon us anger, but do not let that lead you into sin, and don't let the sun go down on your wrath. We can't go on keeping on, well, boy, I'm going to get even with that person. I'm going to execute vengeance on them. I'm going to get revenge for how they acted to me. So if they... They said something catty to me. I'll, be, I'll say it right back to them. If they did me harm, I'll do them harm. An eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth kind of idea. And so he's saying we can't afford to be that way. We can't afford to show that kind of wrath to people. But here's the explanation of why. Is it because what that person did, it doesn't really matter? No, it's because we have no ability to execute righteous judgment on someone else. God is saying, not that we should let it go scot-free, God is saying, I will tend to the problem. And so he says in Romans 12, verse 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Whose wrath? Your wrath? No. You're not going to execute the vengeance. Because God said, back there in the Old Testament, God said, vengeance is mine, I'll do the repaying. It's because we're intruding into the realm of God. You say, well, I want my revenge. God's saying, if that person doesn't repent, 
they will get revenge. But I'll do it. You don't need to do it. I'll tend to it. See, that really makes us understand that transgression against you or harm done to you from that standpoint. And, and this really isn't dealing with civil government and all of that. That's actually in the next chapter of the book of Romans and talk some about that. But rather than us on personality standpoints going out and repaying everybody because they acted a certain way to me, the point is God says, I'll tend to that. I will repay. And so you have terms like wrath and vengeance and punishment there. And the whole point is these belong to God because God is a good God. He is a perfect God, and he's a just God. And because of these things, God will execute what is necessary to execute. God will deal with others in a rightful way, in a proper way. If I'm angry and I go out and execute vengeance, if I get even with somebody, I might do something that is way beyond what is right to do about it. I might, in my anger, misjudge somebody, maybe think that, you know, maybe have it confused, think, well, this person is to blame. They've done this against me. Maybe I've been misinformed. God knows for certain, but I may not know for certain. The vengeance I may enact may be way out of proportion to what was done to me. There can be all kind of things that I, as an imperfect human being, will be able to execute good judgment and good justice, but God can. And so he just simply asked all of us, let me take care of that. I'll do the repay. You take care of acting right. You take care of living right and making sure I don't need to judge you about anything, and I'll execute the vengeance on them. Now, God's perfect goodness and justice, that's why God has to repay. That's why God's justice demands wrath, and it's seen all the way through the Old Testament, people back in Noah's time. We read about Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. The wickedness of man was growing on the planet earth. It was seen everywhere that the intent of the thoughts of the heart was on evil continually. And, and the Lord God was sorry that he'd even made man on the earth. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. God understood what was wrong with man. God understood man's sin and saw what was going on. God decided that it was just for all mankind on this earth to die. Uh, I won't show you the scripture of that right now, but we know that when God saw Noah living righteously, God made an exception. God said, I will save Noah. I'll save his household but I will deal with man because of the sins that he's done in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'll just read you what Peter said about it in the New Testament. He turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them to destruction. And he says, by that, God was making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. You know, there's always been questions about, uh, well, why didn't God deal with others the way he dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah. Surely there's a lot of wicked people in a lot of cities on this planet right now. Why didn't God turn them all into ashes? Did you ever stop to think that God has not consistently done that all throughout the ages? There have been many wicked places, many wicked cities. Corinth was a wicked city. Instead, God sent Paul to preach the gospel there. Why didn't God turn every city to ashes that had wickedness to the proportions of Sodom and Gomorrah. I suggest to you the answer's right there. Sodom and Gomorrah was meant to be an example of what God could do if he so chooses to. Amen. And it's dealing with and showing you that God can judge and God will judge eternally. God will make a final judgment and that foreshadows it. Just like the, the judgment of Noah's day foreshadows the fact that God will make a final judgment. This is an example to anyone that wants to live ungodly. This is what can do, and this is what, you know, destruction is what you're facing as far as judgment day is concerned. There's this glorious scene in the book of Exodus. We know we read about the statement that no man can see God at any time and live. 
But in some way, God chose to reveal himself to Moses. I don't mean just at the burning bush. I meant when they were up there on that mountain. Moses with God in sweet communion. And God was going to reveal himself in a special way. God told Moses to get himself in the cleft of the rock. And from that vantage point, God would allow Moses to see some part of his glory. Now, I don't, was that a vision? Was that really God letting him see some section of his glory? I, I don't know. I just know he was going to reveal his glorious nature to Moses and show him some part of what he was. And it, and it, it says that as, as God moved across where Moses could faintly see from the cleft of the rock, that this was being said. And, and what's interesting, it tells you nothing in that context about what Moses saw, but it tells you what Moses heard. And as this presence of God came by, Moses heard these words, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, who forgives our iniquities and our transgression for sin. And that's that beautiful picture of God that we paint for all men. That's the one that we're trying to get across. God will forgive you of your sins. And that's the goodness of God so well exhibited. And, and we look at that, we thought, well, God is slow to anger. God is compassionate. God does love me. But then he follows it by saying this, yet, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished and he will visit the iniquity of fathers on their children and on their grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. He said, I won't leave it unpunished. I will not leave iniquity unpunished. So on one half of the strip, you've got the goodness of God, and on the other half, you've got the severity of God, don't you? When you read in the book of Revelation, you read about Babylon the Great, which really represented the world at that time, the worldly system, Perhaps Rome, but perhaps more than that, just the idea of, of the worldly order of things. Babylon the Great, it was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. God is a good God, a just God, a righteous God, and therefore vengeance is his, and he demands wrath. God's nature demands justice. If you're doing God's will, you don't have anything to worry about. If you're doing evil, God says, I'm against you. The goodness, really, this whole issue of the goodness and severity of God, we may think, well, how can God be both? But it, it, it's not really about the fact that like God has these two polar opposites. I mean, we've all met people that when they're like the little nursery rhyme, when they're good, they're very, very good, and when they're bad, they're hard. When they're helpful, they're just like the best person on the face of the earth. I've known some people that just would go up, you know, out of their way to help and do and, and be kind and gracious and everything, but man, that could turn on a dime, and they could be ruthless. That's just folks like that. Is that what we're saying about God, that one minute he's over there doing for you and sending the rain and sending the crops and all of that, and the next minute, bam, God's mad because something kind of, you know, flared him up that day, and so now he's this violent personality that's turned from good to evil. No, this isn't what we're saying. God is always both good and severe. God is at all times possessing these qualities. The whole difference doesn't have anything to do with God being like kind of this bipolar deity of some type that, that can be one way one minute, another way the next. His whole point is it all depends on where we stand with him. If I'm re in rebellion against him, severity is my lot. If I am standing with him, his goodness will be with me. It's about me rather than about him of which of those qualities we face. God's wrath and judgment, of course, are going to be seen on the judgment day. In 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 9, it says, To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, 
taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power. This is the lot. Who, who, is the, who are those people? Those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's just out now told you, this is who my wrath will be against on that day. Those, the vengeance of God will be on those who do just that. They'll be punished from the presence of the Lord. The Bible's very clear. This solemn and fierce thing is said by the Lord at the end of the Sermon on the Mount or near the end. He said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What did I say earlier in the lesson? The word severity meant. That it meant a cutting off. Just imagine at this moment in time, God just professes before the Father. I don't know you. I don't know these people. They're not among my, among my people. I, I never knew you. You practice lawlessness. We don't have anything in common. We don't have any fellowship. So you must depart from me. And to depart from Christ is to depart into eternal punishment, away from the presence of the glory of God. And we'll see God's goodness and God's severity on the judgment day. Now, lest you think I'll leave it you know, kind of lopsided, remember some of these statements. Like when Jesus says that for those who did right, the Lord will say these words, enter into the joy of your Lord. On that day, we'll know about those many mansions that the Lord has built. In that day, we know about the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness will dwell. We'll know about the no death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, all things new and improved. That's all ours for the judgment day, you see. If you're in Christ and faithful in him, then God has a plan for you. So God's goodness is going to be seen just like a minute ago we read. God's vengeance will be seen in that day. God's goodness will be seen in that day as well. And that God has demonstrated his goodness. So, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, and some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Don't you think that that well exhibits the goodness of God right there? And that's why throughout life we're looking at, the, at both sides of this. Here's what I think probably, as, as I've tried to say in the lesson, that's where the mistake is made. I think the mistake is made that we interpret God's goodness the wrong way. We look at God's goodness and what God does and the blessings of it and don't understand what he said up there. God's not willing that any should perish. But when God is long-suffering, remember that doesn't mean that the Lord is slack about a coming judgment day. Suddenly, God's not just fooling around. God's not putting off his promise. God's not saying, uh, you know, I don't want to get around to that just yet. God is trying to be patient and give man an opportunity, give us an opportunity to be saved, a sufficient number of probably in God's mind. He's not willing that anybody should perish. It, it, with God, he's not happy that the thought that anybody would have to go to hell. He would desire everybody to be saved and come to a knowledge of truth. Don't misinterpret God's long-suffering good nature as an excuse. Don't say it probably means he won't judge us. It just means that God's giving time and opportunity for men to be saved. Judgment day is still coming. It's still an appointment that we all face. We're going to sing a song just a moment to invite you to respond to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you do that on the basis of your faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A lot of, believe, a lot of people believe that. I'm afraid a lot of people believe that culturally. That is, it's popular to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It, it's decreasing the amount of popularity, but it's still well thought of, especially in our part of the country. You'll, 
you'll for the most part get no shame from anybody if you confess that Jesus is the Son of God, that you believe that. But there's more to it than that, and we have to turn from our ways, our sins, to God in his righteousness. You can see who the judgment day will you know, fall upon. It'll fall upon those who are not doing what's right, those who do evil. So he warns us about that. And God's ready for you to be saved, and he wants you to confess his son, that he's the son of God. He's ready for you to act on baptism because it's there we enter into Christ. And our sins are pardoned. So while we're standing and singing, as you're thinking on these things, if you've not yet been baptized into Christ, this is the day. This is a great day to do and act on that because you've heard and thought about the judgment of God, the severity of God, and you have to ask yourself a serious question. If I died right now in the condition I'm in, would I be lost? Don't romanticize it. Don't say, well, I think God's really nice and he wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything like that to me. I'm asking you to be realistic. Think about what you've heard from God today and ask yourself the question, what about me? Where will I stand in the judgment day? And if you're not ready, it's time to act on that very principle and obey the gospel of Christ. Let's come. If you